Today, when I travel across the continent, and I do, in many countries, I am amazed by the number of buildings whose owners claim are churches. In a distance of one kilometer, you will see different denominations. The Bible is now the greatest instrument in creating false industries in the continent of Africa. And that is not to be celebrated. It is to be frowned upon. And we who claim to be Christians, and I normally use this very deliberately, we claim to be Christians. As to whether we are is another debate. We'll only discover that a little later when we are in heaven. And therefore when we talk about rediscovering, we are saying that it was once discovered. But let us situate the Bible in its proper place. Christianity as we know it today in the continent of Africa was midwifed to us in the continent through Europe, through the missionaries. When they came, they were reading the very same Bible that we are reading today. When they sat in Berlin and were dividing the continent of Africa, they were reading the same Bible that we are reading today. The same Bible in which in Paul's letter to the Galatians at chapter 3, 28, he says, there are no Jews, no Gentiles, no slave, no free, no woman, no man. They read that verse. It was not interpolated later after they came. They read it. But they came here and conquered us. They came here and discriminated against us. The same Bible. They were being mentored by that very same Bible. They came here when they had divided the body of Christ. The English had appropriated the religion in 1534 and they now had their Anglican church complete with the monarch as its head. The Scots had appropriated their own and they had the Presbyterian church. The Greeks had their Greek Orthodox. The Armenians, the Armenian Orthodox. The Roman Catholics were even bolder. They called it the Roman Catholic Church. So that even when they are in Uganda, it's not Ugandan Catholic Church, it is the Roman Catholic Church. And you are going there and you are saying you are Roman Catholic Church. In apartheid South Africa, they are the Dutch Reformed Church, which became the foundation stone upon which apartheid was articulated in 1948 by Hendrik Fafut and his cohorts. So the Bible has been misused. Don't be cheated. Let's not be nice to each other because we are Christians. The Bible has been misused. It has been used to support slavery. It has been used to support colonization. It has been used to pervert the truth. That is the Bible that we are saying we ought to rediscover. So when we are gathered here as Christians and we are talking about rediscovery of mentorship in the Bible, we must have a spirit 
that is a questioning spirit when his grace was um, preaching to us he said we must always be nice before we are good not always and I've always talked about two pro approaches to be found in the Bible one is of John the Baptist and Herodias is a dangerous path where you go out into the public and condemn evil. The only thing that you must know is that when you follow that path, Salome will ask for your head. But there are circumstances when it is necessary. Then there are circumstances when it is necessary to follow the path that his grace has suggested. Read the conversation between Nathan and David and what he did to the wife of Prophet Uriah. He comes and tells him, in this place there was a person who had a lamb. Circumstances define which method you use. And in a forum such as this, we now live in a world where as Christians we are also very pretentious. We don't speak the truth as it ought to be spoken. And when I read the Bible sometimes as a Christian, I ask myself, what kind of Christian would I be? I often ask myself, if I lived in the days of Jesus, which of these disciples would I be? Because let us ask ourselves, when were we first called Christians? In fact, if you read the Bible and the history of Christianity and how we were first called Christians in Antioch, it was not a badge of honor to be called a Christian. It was not a badge of honor. It was a statement that these individuals who follow somebody whom we do not respect, whose ideas we do not respect then, we embraced it. But do we question that as Christians when we are reading the Bible? Do we read the Bible? Many of us who make the claim that we are Christians are not good Bible readers despite your best efforts and best intentions. I normally ask this test question to my audience rather lately. And I'll test it this morning to determine how effectively you read the Bible. When you read the book of Isaiah, chapter 6, it says that in the year that King Uzziah died, the Lord appeared unto Isaiah, the son of Amos. Then I ask Christians, and who is King Uzziah? They do not know. They have never read about him in the Chronicles because they are satisfied with what they are preached to and about. Christians don't read the Bible. They read sections of the Bible. And one of the instruments that are, has now made Christians not read the Bible is social media. They Google a particular section. Your grace, you'll see if you are from in the pulpit occasionally, most of your congregation are not looking at you when you are preaching the word. They are under the table. Many times you read the word and they are looking for it as if it never existed. That is the kind of Christians that we have today, claiming to be Christians. And if they claim to be Christians and you want them to rediscover mentorship from the Bible, how can they be mentored by something whose contents they do not know? I remember when we were baptized, we used to say, I reject the devil with all his works. I'm sure many of you remember that. That is not true. You never rejected the devil with all his works. 
Those were words that you just spoke on the spur of the moment. I remember one day when my little daughter was getting baptized. So we went for preparation for baptism at my church at the All Saints Cathedral. And the provost of the cathedral asked me, do you believe in child baptism? I said, I do not believe in child baptism. And he said, why are you bringing your child? I said, because I don't want you to give her trouble asking why were you not baptized. <laughs> and we entered into a debate and he asked me, why don't you believe in child baptism? I said, it has no biblical basis. Because if it had biblical basis, Christ would have been baptized as a child. That debate still lingers, and I'm quite certain some of you may not agree with me, but it has no biblical basis. As many as believed were baptized. Children cannot believe. They have no power of discerning. I'm still talking about rediscovering mentorship in the Bible. In this congregation, if I were to pick any one of you to recite for me the Ten Commandments in the order in which they were given to Moses, I can assure you, and I'll not try it, I don't want to embarrass anybody. <laughs> Out of ten, possibly only two would recite them in the order in which they were given. Because to you and me, Ten Commandments have become Ten Suggestions. Ten Suggestions to be obeyed only when it is convenient. And yet, if we were to use the Ten Commandments alone as the basis of governing our lives, we would need no other laws in, in, in the world. We would need no other laws in the world. But we do not look to the Bible. The Bible does not guide our lives. The Bible is a convenient thing that we make reference to when we want to cover our sins. It has become a moral fig leaf that we use to hide our nakedness. And I want to tell you that until and unless we change our ways and it's a constant struggle for all of us, I now understand why Christ said how difficult it shall be to get into the kingdom of heaven. I do not know whether it's in Revelation where there is an attempt to say the number of people will get into heaven and heaven is described. I used to think it was very small. I now know not many people may get there. Not many people may get, despite our pretension to the contrary. It is in Matthew 24, 24, where it is recorded that there shall arise many Christs and many prophets who shall work wonders, and inasmuch as it were possible, even the very elect would be cheated by those Christs. And there is no shortage of them today. In every corner, there is a prophet. And they have no shortage of names. Almighty, mighty, prophet. All names of individuals and we follow them faithfully and they are Bible thumping. They can make reference to the Bible. But remember Paul's second letter to Timothy at chapter 3 says in the end, in these end days. And these are those days. Don't worry that it may even take another million years before the world ends. God, I'm told, doesn't count the way we do. But these are those days. And therefore, when we are gathered here as Christians, we must ask ourselves, 
painful and difficult questions are our lives testaments to our claimed Christianity? Forget the many hallelujahs that we shout. We can shout hallelujah all we want. Forget I'm born again that we shout every minute is our life, our life's testament. To the person that we claim to follow Christ, or we are merely church-going Christians, on Saturday, if we are from the SDA, we go to church because that is where you meet your friends. And a one hour sermon is too long. You lose your pastor after 10 minutes and you are busy playing video games in the pews. Is that the kind of Christian you are? Sunday going Christian who thinks he's God's gift to the world? Is that the kind of Christian you are? A Christian whose business is to judge others thinking that you are holier than everybody else? Is that the kind of Christian you are? Because if that is the kind of Christian you are, then you cannot mentor anybody. In Greek mythology, which I want to believe you are all familiar with, there were many gods. One of them was Apollo. And the story goes that he sent out, the oracle was sent out to discover the wisest man in Greece. And when they had gone yonder, they came and said that Socrates was the wisest of all men. Because when he was asked what he knew, he said the only thing that he knew was that he knew nothing. In other words, in order to be truly knowledgeable, you must have humility in you. Are we humble? Because only the humble can be true mentors. And the Bible is full of mentors. Adam was mentored by God, but somehow he was confused, as the Bible says, by Eve, who also claimed that it is Satan who confused her in the first place. So it is not always the case that when you mentor, your mentee turns out right. But that does not mean that mentorship must stop. You rightly said that Moses was mentored by Jethro. Indeed he was. You'll discover the conversation when Moses visited Jethro. And for a whole day he was out judging little petty things. He was told, divide your people into different groups, mentorship, delegation without abdication. Do we do that? Or where we are, we think we are the only ones who know omnipotent, omniscient in our little offices because your Christianity is not just about saying you are Christian on, on, on a Sunday. Where you work, can people testify? Where you work, the little things you do, can people testify that you are a good person? Not by you saying so, by your words, by your deed, can people do so? You will excuse me. But many times now, when people tell me they are born again, I say, what are they hiding? And it's out of experience. What are they about to hide? that they start by saying, I'm born again. Because when you are born again, my interaction with you in 10 minutes will show me that you are born again. And I've gone into restaurants and I see somebody and I ask them, are you born again? By conduct. 
Not by mere words. There is no shortage of Bible-thumping individuals running around claiming they are born again. Those are not mentors. We are here to rediscover mentorship in the Bible. Moses mentors Joshua. Elijah mentors Elisha. And if you go through the Bible, for every king there was a mentor for David Nathan. And whenever you are not mentored, then you lose out. Read 2 Chronicles 26, it says, during the whole period that King Uzziah listened to Zechariah, he did great things. But when he stopped doing so, he tried to do that which was reserved for the sons of Levi. And when he entered to perform a sacrifice, leprosy was on his head and he died a leper. We are rediscovering mentorship in the Bible. Which means that we must read the Bible. Which means that we must understand the Bible. You know, sometimes I ask myself at the risk of blasphemy. Why is it God appears to use individuals whose ways are not straight? Or permits things that are not straight? in order to straighten man. What is the message? Look at the story of Jacob and how he works for Rachel and then given unto him his lair. Not fair. But yet, God in his divine wisdom allows it. Look at Jacob and Esau. What is God telling us? Look at Moses, a murderer. He's the one that is used. Look at David, David a serial adulterer. Serial. Yet he says it is a man after my heart. Look at Solomon, wise, but confused by women. 700 of them, and that is not even enough. 300 concubines. Yet we today, when the judges make good decisions, we say they are Solomonic. What are we being told about mentorship? Look at Saul turned poor. It appears to me that God sometimes picks people from the gutter in order that he may host them. Perhaps it is because they have seen the other side and they can give a testimony and therefore they know why people should not go there. I remember one time I'm at the airport in Dar es Salaam and I get into a conversation with a clergyman of the Catholic, Roman Catholic Exposition, but he was black, he was a black African, but he was a Roman Catholic. <laughs> but the beauty with Roman Catholics is that they, they, they really know the Bible, they read the Bible. So we got into this conversation about Paul, and he told me something in Kiswahili which I think was great and I think remains great in my mind today. He told me, Mungu waiti wana anayo stahili, anawa stahilisha anawa ita. God does not call the deserving. He makes deserving those whom he calls. And I think that is what we should do. We must always in humility recognize that we are only sharing that which we can in the knowledge that if that is midwife divinely, it can create something that is good. And that is why I hold the view that this particular congregation that is here and is taking a solemn vow that we are going to rediscover biblical mentorship. And the word rediscover is very important because it means it was once discovered. 
and it was lost. Where was it lost? It was lost in denominations. Anglicanism, Roman Catholicism, Presbyterianism, SDAism. That is where all this was lost. And until the day that we rise above all these, Our Christianity must be subject to scrutiny. 